Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Alan Holman. I'm the curator at the Hampton History Museum. Thank you for your patience. We had a, a slight technical glitch to overcome. We have an entirely new system that allows us to, uh, to do webcasting like this. So uh, again, thank you for your patience, but I think we are uh, ready to go now. So thank you for joining us again for our Port Hampton Lecture Series. Uh, we're having to approach this in a slightly different way now. Uh, COVID-19 has, has done for us what it's done for you. It's uh, driven us into the virtual world, uh, but we still want to reach out to you and we want you involved with us. The museum itself is open, so you're welcome to come pay us a visit. Uh, we have all of the uh, COVID protocols in place. We can't have large events like Port Hampton Lectures here for the time being for obvious reasons, but we're going to reach you like this. So I'm going to move on directly since I've wasted about 10 minutes of your time already to our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. Uh, she is a uh, very good friend of the Hampton History Museum. Uh, she's a Norfolk, Virginia native, received her BA from University of Virginia and her PhD from the College of William and Mary. Uh, she is professor of history at Norfolk State University and director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for African Diaspora Studies and has received grants to support her various projects. So tonight, uh, she is going to speak to us about a, a wonderful bit of uh, research she uncovered about Dr. Sarah Garland Jones, uh, the first licensed, correct me if I'm uh, incorrect, the first licensed African-American woman doctor uh, in Virginia. So uh, I'm gonna step out of the way. Cassandra, please. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about one of my um, really favorite uh, people that I've uh, done research on, and that's uh, Sarah Garland Jones. And um, so I'm just going to get started. Um, she was part of what we call Freedom's First Generation. She was born in 1866, and women and men who were born around that time period uh, were considered freedom's first generation because they were the first generation that were either born at the time of freedom or right before freedom occurred for African Americans. And of course, this is not only right before or during the period of the Emancipation Proclamation, but for those who were born in, in Virginia, especially in any occupied territories, uh, if they were born in and around the time of the passage of the 13th Amendment, which took effect in December of 1865, they were part of this first generation. And they carried with them the hopes and dreams of over 200 years of people who were in bondage. And those hopes and dreams were realized within one generation. And I want to talk about what she and others in this uh, among this cadre of people were able to accomplish so that we can reposition our understanding of history accordingly. So let me get started. And I've, I'm sorry, okay. So in many ways, I'm gonna give you her full name. Sarah Garland Boyd Jones, in so many ways was a woman of her time. Pious, moral, and imbued with a 19th century notion of what was supposed to be the proper role of gender, she was a race woman who advocated for the advancement of her community. And what we meant by race woman, and I'm talking about we as in historians, is what people at that time meant. And that was that she saw herself as not only an advocate for people who were of African descent, but she saw herself as a role model, as someone who was supposed to invest her time and energy, her resources, her capabilities, her training, her energies into using what gifts she had, what talents, what training she had to not only help in her field, but to help her community at large. And so the majority of people who called themselves race men and race women during this period were not only strong advocates of their community, but invested their time and resources into the community as not only a role model, but they changed the very face of their communities in the first 100 years that they were uh, free. 
Now, her, her uh, whole arc, I would say, um, really started in Richmond, Virginia. And it continued through the public schools. And then it continued when she was accepted into Howard University, University's medical school. And it continued when she returned to Richmond to be licensed to practice medicine. And it continued as she advocated for her people and became one of the most distinguished physicians in her community, so much so that one of the top doctors, even in the white community, gave her eulogy and her funeral was attended by thousands of people. Now, I wanna kinda walk you through a few things that historians do. When we're piecing together the life of an individual, um, it is amazing how many pieces we have to verify, we have to look at, we have to double check because sometimes the census records are incorrect, sometimes uh, the documents have a wrong date or a misspelled name or whatever, and so you have to verify back and forth, back and forth to see who are the people that you're talking about and what happened in their life. So I decided to show you this Freedmen's Bureau record because it tells you a little bit about Sarah, Sarah Jones's father, George, George W. Boyd. And it shows, we, we can see from this document that he was already married to a woman by the name of Ellen. Her name was Ellen Garland. She was from Albemarle County and he was from Chesterfield County. And her family moved to Chesterfield County and that's how they met. And then they moved to Richmond sometime at the end of the Civil War. Um, and he uh, got a job as a carpenter and eventually became one of the most prominent um, builders and, con and contractors in Richmond. He was certainly at the top of his game, game among all of the African American contractors, but even among the white ones, he was one of the leading contractors. But he started as a carpenter working with the Freedmen's Bureau, and you can see in this document that his parents by this period of time, which was approximately it, uh, uh, taken in about 1868, 1870, that in this document, uh, I'm sorry, 1872, that in this document his parents were deceased and that he was an only child. And so as I constructed this narrative, I wanted to provide some background about who he was and where they lived on Clay Street and eventually the family moved to North Street, which was in the heart of the Jackson Ward before Virginia built uh, I-64, Interstate 64, and they, the officials uh, chopped the Jackson uh, Ward in half with the interstate, really disrupting and destroying a lot of that very prosperous community. Before all that happened, um, that's where they settled. And you can see in the census record, I pulled out a little bit of information to show this is a little bit about the family. Um, Sarah Garland Jones, excuse me, Sarah Garland Boyd Jones was one of eight children. The youngest one died sometime uh, in the 1870s, and but they continued. Um, you can see that Ellen, uh, her mother, Sarah's mother, was listed as keeping house. But what's interesting about this family is that they would advance. The father would not just stay as a carpenter, hiring out his time instead. He would become a major builder in Richmond. The mother, Ellen, would actually go to school and become a nurse. And um, some of uh, Sarah's other siblings would go into different professions, including one of her sisters, who would become a physician just like Sarah. Now, when Sarah, um, I said she was born in 1866, and when Sarah went to school, um, she went to eventually Richmond Colored Public Schools. 
Um, this was the only school for African Americans at this time, and she had the, the, the um, benefit of having a principal, Lizzie Knowles, who was a northern abolitionist who came during the time following the Civil War, and she was a teacher. She believed um, in making sure that not only were African Americans educated, and I mean classically educated, so that they could enter the professions, but she also encouraged people to think outside of the box. She encouraged the young ladies to believe that they could be more than whatever society deemed uh, their jobs. So she did not uh, allow young girls to believe that their only lot in life, so to speak, was to be a domestic worker or to be a nurse or to be a teacher, that, that their, their professions were unlimited. And one of them, um, Sarah Jones's classmates was a woman by the name of Maggie Walker. And Maggie Walker, initially Maggie Mitchell, uh, became the first woman in the nation to start a bank. And she also started a department store and a host of other businesses. She would eventually hire a number of women and men from the African-American community to be bank managers, training them in the art of a financial institution. And of course, that particular bank, St. Luke's Bank, continued on for many, many years. And so those were some of the people who were impacted by this principal, Lizzie Knowles, and Sarah Jones was one of them. So at, when she was Sa Sari, excuse me, Sarah Boyd, she went by the name of Sally. And Sally, um, uh, eventually when she finished uh, the colored normal school, she got a job like many of her classmates as a teacher. In fact, Maggie Mitchell, later Maggie Walker, started as a teacher. They got that was their first job. At the age of 18, they were able to get their footing, uh, earn a living, uh, begin to network with other young people who were also graduating and getting jobs in the public schools. And this was at the time that there was a fight going on in Richmond over jobs in the public schools. In fact, um, uh, as many of the white female abolitionists uh, left or were pushed out of jobs in the schools when uh, Virginia adopted a public school system, there were a number of white women who were taking those jobs and they were very resentful about having to teach African Americans. And so the black community pushed hard to change that and to get the school board to finally uh, begin to hire black teachers in the school system. And Sally was one of those individuals. Um, but the group of young people who were graduating, part of Freedom's first generation, began to meet separately uh, after school. Um, they formed a literary club. They encouraged their students to participate in that. And um, they were not contented with simply continuing to be a teacher unless that was their passion. Instead, some of them joined other associations such as the True Reformers. This was an organization that had a prominent branch in Richmond. And the True Reformers was a fraternal organization that had a bank, it had a newspaper, it had a host of other businesses. And so some of the individuals would actually leave teaching and become members of that, not only of that organization, but they would get jobs within that organization and they would prosper. Well, sometime around 18, in the early 1880s, about 1883, Sarah met her future husband. And uh, when they met, and he was also teaching, by the way, uh, and when they met, they decided um, of course, that she would have to stop teaching because the rules were, the law, the ordinance, I should say, in Richmond was that if you were a female, you could no longer 
teach in the public schools once you were married because, as they argued, that was taking jobs away from men. Now, what was interesting is a little bit after they got married, Richmond passed an ordinance that limited the amount the um, uh, African-American men from continuing to teach. They wanted to limit that number. And so her husband actually had to leave teaching, and he became an important member of the um, true reformers. And later on, even Sarah would become closely associated with the true reformers. But as you can see, she was a member, uh, she was one of the teachers in the Baker School. And this was the first school that actually was built, even though it was not built according to the same standards as the white schools. This was a newer school for African American students, and she was one of them. And the, the schoolhouse was described in, in kind of horrific ways. There was, a, there was no indoor plumbing. There was a single stove. Um, the, this was a three-story brick building, so there was one stove for the entire building, and it was in desperate need of paint. That was how it was described. But she continued, and she stayed there for about five years. The man that she would marry is Miles Jones. And theirs was a rather interesting partnership. Before I actually um, go into a little bit of the next slide, I wanted to mention this. It's very few men at this time who would have been comfortable with a wife who had a higher degree than them, who had an earning capacity that could have exceeded theirs, and um, who was willing to allow his wife to travel away and go to school and become a professional uh, and not be together. But that was the case with Sarah and Miles. In fact, in 1890, Sarah would uh, apply and get in, gain entrance to Howard University Medical School. And her husband would continue to remain in Richmond while he worked with the True Reformers organization and she then would work for three years getting her degree in medicine. And in fact, what was interesting about Howard at that time is that Howard University um, drew a number of important physicians, black physicians, to his staff. In fact, some of the Two of the, the main people, Charles Purvis and Alexander Augustus from Norfolk, um, these were surgeons who distinguished themselves during the Civil War and became prominent physicians uh, and teachers at Howard Medical School. And so she had an opportunity to be taught by these and other individuals. In fact, what's interesting is when she entered medical school, 20% of the class uh, was made up of women. And a lot of people are very surprised by this. We're talking 1890, that so many African American women were choosing to be physicians, not nurses, not teachers, physicians, while other groups were choosing to go into business ventures. And of course, we would see another woman similar in name to Maggie Walker, Madam C.J. Walker up in New York during the same period of time enter businesses, all part of freedom's first generation. One of the, if, you, if I can direct your attention to uh, this, um, uh, just a piece of, of the Howard Medical School uh, records, you can see in the middle toward the bottom, Sarah Garland Jones, and it tells a little bit about her and where she lived in Richmond, and of course, what class. She was part of the class of 1893. What's also interesting is that some of the students at Howard Medical School were white, 
most students uh, that I've had, uh, when I talk to them about Sarah Garland Jones and I show them some of these records, they're very, very surprised when they see that, um, that there were white students at some of these professional schools that were at HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. In the case of Howard Medical School, a pretty large percentage, about 40% of the students at one point in the early, the latter part of the 19th, early part of the 20th century were actually white men attending this school. Now, this article, it announces after three years that Sarah Garland Jones would be the first woman to be licensed to practice medicine, um, first African-American woman to be licensed to practice medicine in Virginia. And I hesitated for a minute because there was another woman, a white woman who was the first woman to be licensed to practice medicine in Virginia. But at the time that Sarah Jones finished and received her license after she successfully completed her, her exams, um, that woman no longer lived in Virginia. So when Sarah was the first to be licensed to practice medicine as an African American woman, she was actually the only one licensed in Virginia as a woman to practice medicine. And you would think in 1893 that would stymie in some way her ability to practice medicine. But Sarah Jones was truly an exceptional individual. She was someone who had both males and females as her patients, but she also had both blacks and whites as her patients. In fact, when she opened up her home office where she lived, she also had an office that was located about a mile from her home and so she would actually open up her office at about 7 or 8 a.m. and then travel to her home office and open that at around 9 or 10 in the morning. And then she would travel by horse and buggy to her office in, at Navy Hill, which was to be an outreach to women and children in particular. Then she would go back to her home office, or her, her, the main office, not where, her, where she lived, but her main office, and she would operate a free clinic for women and children. And then she would travel back home, and she would continue to see patients until well into the evening. She would also make home visits. And then I, I did a, a tracking of her journey by horse and buggy. Each day, she was traveling about six miles to and from her home to all the offices and back. Every day, six miles. In addition to all of that, she was very active in her community, giving speeches to all the different organizations, the YWCA, the YMCA. She was the um, uh, the, the medical practitioner, the physician for the True Reformer organization. So if you were a member of that organization, she was your doctor. She was also um, uh, traveling around, um, going to some of the prisons and some of the juvenile reform agencies, encouraging young people who found themselves in those situations encouraging them to achieve. Uh, she was all over the place. In fact, one of the things that, that struck me, and it's in this next article, uh, she was very much involved with even helping, uh, even though she was way in the background, but she was involved in helping, helping to open a colored training school in Richmond. And so Sarah was not a person who was content to just, to just practice medicine. That was enough, but she was insistent on making a difference, using her life's experiences, her skills, and so forth to help others, to encourage others, to find uh, other ways, other avenues of being successful, and to provide services 
free to children and to women who were particularly harmed at this time by the medical community because women's health was seen as something that was not as important. In fact, most physicians at this particular time regarded most illnesses associated with women as, <coughs> excuse me, as a psychological trauma that was connected in some way to their uterus. That's why when women had certain conditions that um, made it necessary to remove the uterus, they called it a hysterectomy because it was assumed that there was some hysteria involved in and connected to problems with the uterus, and that's why a woman had pain. And so you remove the uterus, you remove this association, the psychological association with pain that in the minds of many physicians did not exist. And so Sarah Jones was very much an advocate of looking into the real issues that African American women had, and she helped others to begin to find ways to change how um, healthcare was delivered to African American women. In fact, one of the, the women, and I wanted to, to mention this in particular, which is why I'm, I'm hovering on this particular article, this Women's Central League Training School. It was supposed to provide, and it did, household service by educating women about the economics and the sanitation of household uh, care. Um, you know, this was the time period we're talking about around the turn of the 20th century. So the 1899 to 1901 period. This is the time period when people are really starting, people as in our society and our scientists, they're really starting to understand what, how germs are transmitted. Um, for a long time, in fact, you all may be surprised that during the Civil War, many physicians believed that after a hard march, all the soldiers were to refrain from drinking water and they were to drink only alcohol. Of course, we know alcohol dehydrates you in even further. And so this actually killed a number of people because they were being instructed to do something contrary to what would actually help them. There were a lot of uh, changes that happened during the Civil War. In fact, um, that whole time period is considered the birth of modern medicine because there were over a million people who were impacted by the war medically. They were harmed in some way. Um, this gave um, medical science an opportunity to observe so many different uh, illnesses, so many different injuries that they learn in some cases by killing the patient. Um, and they, and medical science advanced during that period. And so Sarah Jones became a physician at a time when medicine was really much more medically, scientifically based. Um, and there were so many different discoveries that were happening at that particular time. And she was on the cutting edge of all of that, but also, and more importantly, she was pushing for more education, more research, more attention to, to health issues that women in particular had, and of course, by extension, children. And so this kind of opened the door to a lot of efforts to really explore healthcare issues having to do with women. We know, though, that about 30 years after that time period, there was a retraction of that exploration. In fact, many medical schools began to make it harder for women, especially African-American women, to enter into medical schools. And so we saw a contraction in the numbers of women going into medicine. And we would not see an increase again until the 1970s and 80s. So she was definitely an important pioneer. But this particular training school was also to train nurses in how to care for their patients. And in addition to that, they had um, about eight beds that they later expanded 
uh, to assist women in particular, uh, and especially women going through the birthing process, but helping women with their health care issues. And afterwards, there would be something even more important that Sarah Gar Garland Jones would be involved in. Now, I wanted to mention a little bit about Richmond. And I wanted to show you this particular picture. Uh, this was the main business section uh, right there in Jackson Ward. And what you're doing is you're looking at North and 2nd Street, looking from Lee Street. So this is the, the area where Sarah Garland Jones lived and worked. And I also wanted to introduce you to her husband, Miles Jones, uh, who interestingly, while he worked as a, um, a manager in the True Reformers, he eventually joined his wife and in 1897 uh, completed Howard Medical School and also became a physician who specialized in issues having to do with people's hands and uh, feet, uh, which was very important, especially if you were a laborer. And I wanted to highlight this particular man, uh, Dr. James Blackwell, who, along with Sarah Jones, uh, was very involved in helping to start these institutions that were important to African Americans. So he was the one who started the training school that I showed you the article for, the Women's Central uh, League Training School. But there was something that would happen in 1902. After the training school was created, Dr. Jones called together all of the black physicians, and she was the only female, even in, in 1902, and she called them together to meet her in her office. And she said she wanted to organize a medical society in Richmond with the hope that it would not only encourage more scientific research, but it would also create a hospital, a hospital specifically for African Americans. And so momentous was this gathering that the, the Times, the Richmond paper, even printed an article about this meeting. So it got the attention of the white community. That's how important this particular meeting was. And the aim of the organization, as I said, was to invest in more scientific research that would enhance the health care of the black community. But it would also, a little bit later on, reorganize themselves as the Richmond Hospital Association. And their purpose, and I quote, was to erect, establish, and maintain in the city of Richmond, Virginia, a hospital for the treatment and cure of diseases and injuries. And that particular hospital would later be known as Richmond Community Hospital. Now, this picture I wanted to show you was when they first founded this hospital, that's what it looked like. So often they would take a building or a home and convert it to a hospital. Because hospitals in this time period um, were often not, not a a constructed building specifically for a hospital. It was a converted building. Uh, throughout the Civil War, they would simply convert buildings, um, dormitory space or whatever, and make them into hospitals. But by the time we got to the latter part of the 19th, early 20th centuries, they started adopting certain sanitation protocols. They began adopting protocols in terms of separating patients out because the hospitals were places where surgeries would take place, uh, where people would recover instead of just being a hospital where people would be quarantined, those who had contagious illnesses. That's how hospitals hospitals were viewed prior to the turn of the 20th century. Afterwards, hospitals would be seen as places where people would get well. I want to show you this other picture to give you an ex another example. This was the Women's tra League Training School, again, a converted building that became a hospital. So all of these earlier buildings looked just like this because they were not constructed specifically as a hospital. 
This is the article that I spoke about in the Richmond Times um, talking about this meeting. And so again, we would see in 1902 the formation of this organization, and then later on that same year they would reform as the Richmond Hospital Association and create the hospital that I showed you initially. Now, before I, I go into that, I wanted to just show you this picture. This would later be the first hospital that that association would actually construct, and they would rename it the Sarah Jones Memorial Hospital. And of course, I have to tell you why it became a more memorial hospital, because two years after, and let me back up for a minute, two years after the organization was founded and the dream was put in place, or I should say three years after, the dream was put in place to have this hospital and to invest research and time and effort into creating a hospital and to creating more research having to do, especially with African American health, Sarah Jones had a massive stroke at the age of 39 and died. And of course, I'd like to um, um, quote um, a, a Chinese philosopher who said that, quote, the flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And certainly Sarah Garland Jones was that flame. Because as I was doing research on this topic and I saw all the things that she had done in such a short period of time, I thought, oh my goodness, this woman has really pushed herself beyond the limits. And then I saw an article that confirmed that she had pushed herself beyond the limits and had um, essentially worked herself to death. And, but she left a powerful, powerful legacy. And when she was, when it was announced that she was um, deceased, uh, thousands of people came out to show that they were mourning her death. At her um, funeral, uh, all the newspapers in the region, white and black, published articles about her and talked about how she would be missed. There were people from all parts of the city who came to her funeral. The, the church was so full that the majority of people were on the outside of the church because it was standing room only. And throngs of representatives from organizations that she was a part of came out, such as the Star of Bethlehem Fountain of the True Reformers, the Royal Court of the Order of Calenth, the Independent Order of St. Luke. There were sermons such that were given by uh, the Reverend Dr. Zachariah Lewis. She has done all that she could, <clears throat> and Dr. George Ben Johnston, who was the city's most prominent physician, uh, eulogized her talking about this untimely death of a dynamic young professional who could have accomplished more had she lived just a few more decades. Ironically, society constricted quite a bit following her death, but her husband and her followers those who were her patients, those who were her friends, did not want to see her legacy die. And they created, um, they, they actually renamed the hospital, the Sarah Jones Memorial Hospital. And I want to show you a picture. Uh, they placed it on what would become the campus of Virginia Union. And that is a very uh, horrid picture of Richmond Community Hospital about in 1934 that was published in the Richmond Times Dispatch. And then later on in the 1950s, this is another picture of Richmond Community Hospital. So it went from the Sarah Jones Memorial, uh, then when they rebuilt it, 
um, they rebuilt it on Virginia Union's campus and renamed it Richmond Community Hospital. And this is the hospital today. And I want to mention this. There were over 200 black-owned hospitals in the nation by the time we got to the 1950s. Only one survives, Richmond Community Hospital. And so I want to, with that last word, remind you of the legacy of this important woman, Sarah Garland Jones, who died at a very young age of only 39, but left so much of a legacy for us to remember. And so I thank you for your time, and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, Thank you. A wonderful presentation. And I'm sorry to step in front of Cassandra, but uh, again, new system. We're working out the bugs. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we do have time if you want to ask some questions. Uh, we are monitoring, and we will pass them along to Cassandra over the next few minutes. Uh, but again, uh, our apologies for starting late. Uh, but we had a glitch with a brand new system of hardware just installed. And uh, we're learning a uh, steep curve for us. We're historians. You know, we don't understand technology. So uh, again, I am going to step off frame. And uh, we will look for questions. And as they come in, we will ask them uh, of Cassandra. And thanks again for joining us for the Port Hampton Lecture Series. Remember that on the 19th, we'll be doing the same kind of thing again with uh, David Gardner, a uh, traditional fiddle fiddle player who's going to walk us through uh, the, those traditions in Virginia. So bring us some questions and we'll try to get right back to you. And while I'm waiting for questions, I want to let you all know that um, this particular article that I wrote on Sarah Garland Jones that was published in the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography in 2017 um, was not only a labor of love, but it took a long time to write. Because with all the things that Sarah Garland Jones did, none of her papers survived. All of the things that I found out about her, I collected bits and bobs with census reports, with Freedmen Bureau records, with the, the odd um, article that came out that would tell a little bit of this part of her story, a little bit of that, an announcement that she gave a speech at this organization, she was a member of this organization, she served in this capacity. So it really tells you the, the difficult story the difficult path that those of us who are historians have in trying to recount the story of so many prominent African Americans. In fact, she was buried in Evergreen Cemetery in Richmond, and that's a perfect example of how difficult it is to uncover so much of the specific details of African Americans. This was a prominent cemetery in which you had Maggie Walker and Sarah Garland Jones, her husband Miles, and many other prominent people were part of Freedom's generation born. Um, uh, in the period following the uh, Civil War. And this cemetery was privately owned because there were very few public black cemeteries for black people in Virginia. And so she, this private cemetery, once so many generations passed, this private cemetery's members or the owners of those cemeteries didn't have children. Sarah and her husband, Miles, never had any children. And when he remarried, he and his wife never had any children. And so it went on and on and on. And so the cemetery was uh, overgrown and dilapidated, filled with weeds, um, on the side of, of interstate system. Uh, many people didn't know, uh, didn't remember that it was there. Um, but bits of it remained in people's minds, and little by little, 
uh, the community has um, galvanized its forces to not only restore the cemetery, but bring back its memory and make sure that it's part of a historic trail. And they had to piece together the histories as they recovered some of these tombstones. Some of them were broken, uh, destroyed by vandals, or broken over time uh, because of weather damage. Uh, and so that kind of speaks to this journey that historians have to be on as they are uncovering this incredible history of people who really transformed our society. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, did she have siblings and what uh, careers might they have pursued? All right. So let me just get all the names. So she was the oldest. She had a brother, Arthur, another brother, Frank, a sister, Jenny, another sister, Betty, George Jr., who passed away at a very early age, Emily, and Peter. Um, and most of her brothers um, followed their father in the construction business, uh, and that's Arthur, Frank, um, and Peter. Jenny actually followed her sister and became a physician. And I know this may be strange, but she ended up marrying her sister's husband after, she, after her sister passed away. So it was Jenny and Miles who spent the rest of their lives together, um, both physicians, just as Sarah and Miles were both physicians. Emily. Uh, and Betty went into nursing. And, um, and it seemed as if there was a propensity for the women to go into some form of, of medicine, and the men seemed to go into some form of construction or carpentry. Well, a very uh, successful family. Yes. Uh, another question. Uh, this work taking place in the 1890s, uh, the Jim Crow era, we describe it. Uh, why do you believe she was able to attract white patients? You know, um, most people don't realize that um, housing wasn't segregated uh, until the cities started mandating the segregation. Many people who are black and white often rented rooms or apartments in the same building. Um, and this actually continued through the turn of the 20th century. It was at, after that, at, in the early part of the 20th century that you started to see segregation enforced. And you started to see um, uh, lines of division. And these, those lines were usually enforced on the side of blacks. So for example, the cities created a black business community but you could have whites operating in that black business community, owning businesses um, and, and doing business with blacks. But blacks could not open up a business in the white business community. Um, and so th there was always an imbalance and an inequality there. Um, a lot of people also, because the number of physicians were limited, um, and often she reached out to the communities that actually lived um, in an integrated kind of setting. It seems as if a lot of people were not necessarily um, uh, concerned about whether or not uh, she was black or white. Now, of course, you all saw the pictures of her. So she actually looked like a white woman. But in communities such as this, it was very clear to a lot of people who was black and who was white, even when they did not necessarily, if they were black, they, didn't, they did not necessarily look black. Um, and you also saw poor whites tended to not be concerned at all about whether a person was black or white uh, when it came to a physician and whether or not they were providing medical care, especially free medical care to an individual. Again, that would change significantly 
by the time we got into the 20th century. And you may ask, well, wait a minute now. Richmond was a very <laughs> pro-Confederate, pro-slavery area. That is true. And yet in that city, during the time of slavery, we would see some very interesting things occur. For example, everyone knows about uh, the Devil's Half Acre, and this, this notorious slave jail uh, that was in Richmond. Um, and yet the owner of that notorious slave jail was at least unofficially married to a black woman who was his slave. And then after the end of the Civil War, he married her and then made her the inheritor of all of his property. And that's kind of the weird part of slavery that it, it creates interesting bedfellows. Um, you would also see a significant proportion of the black community classified as mulatto. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that they were half white and half black. Many were simply light-skinned. Um, but there seemed to be um, a very close relationship uh, built on family connections that actually happened among black, the, the black and white communities. Um, what seemed to be the issue is whether those connections were formalized. So if, for example, a person wanted to um, uh, be uh, an individual who is exercising power over a white person, that's when you would see a lot of racial animosity occur. If blacks were publicly advocating for their rights and their privileges, you would see a lot of white animosity occur. But if blacks were providing a service to whites, you often would not see that animosity. So that may have accounted for the reason or those things that I mentioned may have accounted for the reasons why she had a number of white patients. But I too was very surprised when I read that she had a number of white patients and that many of them came out to, um, to say goodbye to her at her funeral. All right, Cassandra, we have a couple more that seem related. Uh, one question is, uh, it's about how we are remembering her now. Uh, one being that is there a marker or a plaque or a historic marker of, about her, uh, remembering her, and since they changed the name of the hospital, uh, how are we recognizing, uh, remembering her name? So. Okay, so the, to the first question, um, uh, there were several people, including myself, who recommended that she be, part, be one of the women actually named on the women's monument that's in Richmond. And so she is. Uh, she's memorialized there. And in Richmond Community Hospital, when you first walk in uh, to the main entrance, you will see a whole section there uh, talking about and memorializing Sarah Garland Jones. Very good. And one last question, which I think you hit on just a little bit, a uh, question very straightforward. Uh, was Dr. Jones of mixed race? Uh, duh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she was. Um, and there are some indications that she may have been connected with Jefferson and Thomas Jefferson. And the reason I say that is because the Garland family, which was her family, um, there's some research being done right now looking at the Garland family connection to the Jefferson family. Um, and when her birth was announced, or at least talked about, they always put this phrase there, that she was born in view of Monticello. And so that makes me wonder, was that the location, or was that a reference to her association, or her family's association? Um, I think there's a combination of both. Um, and, um, and probably based on the fact that her father was considered a very light-skinned 
they said mulatto, which is simply a light, very light-skinned man. Her mother was considered extremely light-skinned, um, that she probably had far more white ancestry than black ancestry, although she self-identified as African-American. All right, well, thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm gonna wander back into the <laughs> picture here. Uh, again, thank you for your patience with us tonight. We're learning as we go along. Dr. Newby Alexander was incredibly gracious tonight as our mistake started early and, and dragged her into our chaos a little early as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Newby Alexander, and join us again soon.